I'm joined right now on the phone by the uh, wonderful, esteemed composer Osvaldo Golihoff. He's a multi-Grammy award-winning composer. He's received a, a Guggenheim Fellowship, also a MacArthur Genius Grant. He's been composer in residence with leading orchestras, ensembles, and institutions, and he's often worked with the Silk Road Ensemble, and that is what brings him to the phone today to talk about a new album of his music with the Silk Road Ensemble. First of all, let me welcome you, Mr. Gillerhoff, to uh, FM91. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. This is an extremely powerful, powerful work that you've created. It's called Falling Out of Time. It's based on the novel of that name by the author W. Grossman. And, you know, on the surface, it's about grief, coming to terms with grief, specifically a, a father in search of his son who has died. Um, l- let's talk about the novel and the idea behind the story first, because your music sort of takes it to a, a completely different level that only music can do. So tell us about how you became interested in writing this piece, Falling Out of Time. And I know it's an impossible question, but tell us a little bit of, of what it's what it's really about. Right. Um, well, I think before the book, I, I, was, I, I recognize now that I was always uh, puzzled and by by the question of how does one continue to live just simply to keep to stay alive after losing a child um that question first came to me when i was about 7 years old and my great grandfather came to live in my town for a little while because one of his children of his sons was ill and he eventually died, and my great-grandfather slept in my bedroom. And I remember very vividly waking up and seeing him next to the window praying early in the morning. So, um, And I would ask myself, even at that age, how, how is it possible? Um, um, this, On the other hand, it, the, the writer of the novel, David Grossman, told me how when he and his wife received the news of the death of their son by two soldier messengers came to tell them, the first thing they did was to go upstairs to the bedroom of their youngest daughter, who was 12 at the time, and to tell her that her brother had died. And she woke up, and, and the first thing she said to them was, but we shall live. So it's that. I think that the piece is basically about those two uh, contradictory forces, right? Uh, the, the force to keep alive, to stay alive, but also the near impossibility to do so. How would you describe this piece? There are three different singers. You you have all the, these different episodes mm-hmm. that are sort of gathered into three different sections with an interlude. I mean, there is um, kind of a ritual aspect to it as presented in music. Mm-hmm. How, how would you describe it? Is it a song cycle? <laughs> I think you describe it very well. <laughs> uh. um, I, you know, it. We struggled to find a, a, a category to the piece because it's not an opera and it's not a song cycle. I think yes. I think what you said perhaps is the most appropriate. Is some uh, kind of ritual is. I, I would say it's almost like an anti-requiem because it's, uh, you know, it's this endless walk, a metaphorical walk that the father takes in search of his son, a little bit like Orpheus, right? Like the myth of Orpheus and mm. the opera about Orpheus, uh, the, 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 the walk towards the netherworld, um, towards that place that does not exist, really. Uh, um, and And it's not... I think it's almost like an anti-requiem in the sense of, of the illusion that the father has that as long as he walks, uh, his son is somehow alive, and the requiem implies an acceptance. I don't think that there is that there is a little bit of an acceptance towards the end of the novel and, and towards the end of the piece, but then after that acceptance, again, the, the stab 
of the question, where are you, where are you, comes back, right? So it's a, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> we yeah. call it, we decided to call it a tone poem in voices because David Grossman called his novel a novel in voices. And it is true. I think it, it is, if anything, it is related to the tradition of writing tone poems, except that they are mostly instrumental, uh, you know, in, in, in the classical uh, literature. But this one is, yeah, these three voices are essential to the piece. Uh, tell me a little bit about your uh, work with David Grossman in, in creating this piece. You brought him in on the project, right? Yeah, yeah. At, at the beginning, he said, he, you know, he gave us his blessing and he says, he said he did not, as a, as a rule, he does not collaborate with adaptations of his works, which there have been many. I mean, he's a incredibly uh, one of the great writers, I think, of our time. Um, but as the process went on, and given that this piece is so, so personal to him, and for me it was a very, I, I was full of fear, because who am I to to try to imagine what it is like to be in his shoes, right? So I, we asked him to come to one of the workshops that we did with the Silk Road Ensemble, uh, that was in the, in the Holy Cross College uh, Contemplative Center, which is extraordinarily inspiring. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it has a, a, a chapel with enormous windows, and and we just lived there for, I think, four days, and David came all the way from Israel, and his presence, his talking to each of us individually and to the group about what it, what the book meant to him, writing the book, the, and, and also... Um, there, there were some key things that he told us how grief is an exile and how the father and the mother who love their son with the same intensity are each of them in their own island of grief. So it, it's, an, it's such an isolating experience. And I think the piece is basically trying to not to make it isolated, but to say, I see you. And I will accompany you up to the point where it is ever possible to accompany a person who has suffered that loss. Yeah. It, it seems like the Silk Road Ensemble and your musical style, for lack of a better word, r really fits this piece so well because of, uh, you know, you draw on different styles, you draw on different instruments from different cultures, and you bring it all together. And I mean, grief is a human emotion that we all share, mm -hmm. you know, whether we speak English or Hebrew or Chinese or whatever culture we happen to come from. Can you talk a little bit about how you used the different cultures and brought them together into this work musically? Right. I, um, yeah, grief, if you live, live long enough on this planet, you will experience it and you know how how you actually, while you are grieving, you are falling out of time. You are, you know, the world keeps going, the, 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 the clocks keep ticking, the seasons change, the day turns into night, there are all these rhythms, and yet your rhythm is outside the world, is in that exile, right? And, and grief is universal, as you said. I mean, it's not uh, something that, we, we are seeing this in the pandemic, right? I mean, it affects all of us. Um, now, I think that more than the, the you know, I, I love, of course, the instruments that I use, but I love even more than the instruments, the people that are playing them here, right? So if mm. the, these people would be playing different instruments, I would still would have done the piece for them. Even if they all play just guitar, I would have done the piece for the thing guitars yeah. because it's their human energy is the the capacity of these people to discover uh nuances between um in in between the notes right i mean like um you know how in the piano between a b and the c and a c there is nothing right it's just like there's not it's just two white keys that are next to each other without even a black key in between but the silk road is able to to find 
thousands of notes in between, and not uh, not pitch, but emotions. Mm. Right? And that is so. That's why I wanted to work with them. I, I couldn't have done the, the, this piece goes to places that we had not in which we had not been before, musically and emotionally. And the only people I, I knew that could do it was them. I mean, just the fact that we spent all those days living together and, and playing from morning to night and exploring. And, and then the other thing that they have that I, I love is that they have a, an, a, almost a cosmic spiritual silence at their core. Right, there is something, a stillness that very, very few other ensembles have. I think, you know, I think individual musicians have that, but I never had seen an ensemble that that has that emotional silence at their core. Yeah, you mentioned the pandemic, and of course, many more people experiencing grief now in terms of being isolated, in terms of actually losing people right. to the mm -hmm. disease. What is the relevance of this piece in a time when people are cut off from each other? And mm -hmm. I'm thinking specifically like, you know, in performance, I've seen videos of performance, and mm -hmm. it's a communal experience, everybody sharing right. in their grief. But listening to this album on my own, you know, sitting in a room, it's a, a different kind of coming to terms mm -hmm. with grief. Can you talk about? Yeah, that? yeah, absolutely. The piece, the piece is, uh, as we said before, it's it's primarily about accompanying and and that accompanying about the community trying to be to to say to a griever, "I see you, and I'm with you." Right, and in that sense, what you said is is absolutely true. Right, when when the the, the 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 ensemble is in front of you and you are together with the other audience members, it's a whole different experience than listening to the record in your room. Uh, and yet, I think that both experiences are like with any kind of music, very uh, powerful. Right. Um, and the pandemic, I think that the, what the pandemic shares with the piece is that the pandemic is at a global level. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's the, the turning upside down of what we thought was the natural order of things, right? I mean, who would have had, imagined, especially here, that we are in the first world and, and technologically savvy and all of that, who would have imagined that that we that the the natural order of things as we thought the so called natural order of things would be turned upside down and we would be isolated and people would be dying and and fear and 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 you know all all the consequences that this is bringing it's almost as if in as a world now we are, we have fell out of time right yeah. so i think it, in that sense i feel that there is something in common yes I I could go through and ask you about specific pieces here, but I will point out that for me, the most powerful moment in the entire work comes at the end when it's just the solo childlike voice mm -hmm. singing the yeah. words, which I guess is a resolution of sorts. The, the text right. is, there is breath, there is breath inside the pain. And you mm -hmm. start with a lot of pain <laughs> in the music. Right. And then it melts just into this childlike voice. Can you talk about how you resolve this story, how you resolve these questions, if yeah. you do? Well, yeah, it's not, I wouldn't say that there is a resolution, but like you, you pointed out, there is, it is possible without this, never resolution, this state of never resolving, it is possible to find moments in which one breathes, where this, it is possible to breathe. And that's all you can aspire to. You cannot aspire to reach that place where the father wanted to reach. He, he acknowledges that. You cannot aspire to resolve that grief, but you can aspire to have these bubbles, these pockets of breathing of being able to breathe and and that's what it is 
um, I mean, it's, it's related a little bit like uh, the, what is it, the, the last number of the Requiem is the Liberame, right? I mean, mm. it's this, the, this idea that in the end, there is some kind of acceptance, but only in the very, very end. Yeah. Yeah. It's wonderful. And, and it addresses these questions in the way that only music and art and poetry can. Everybody has their own answer that they have to find in, in this journey. I'm wondering what kind of personal resonance you may have taken from this journey yourself, because I imagine writing the piece and rehearsing it and performing it has been an artistic, you know, a journey for you as well. I mean, where, where yeah. have you, what, what have you realized in creating this work? Well, uh, if I told you that I understand any better, I would not be telling the truth. I don't think that I, quote unquote, learned, because I think that I'm, I, I, I still, is a, that is, that, that, Thing that inspired the piece is the thing I fear the most in life. Like I think most people, right? I mean, one fears more the, the unnatural death of a child before your own death than, you know, and, and I think mm -hmm. that I, I don't think that I'm any wiser. But I think to me it was, I realized that I know personally uh, seven couples between friends and family who have experienced this. And and we all try to avert our gaze, right? Because mm. it's such a, you know, you try to, to pretend that things are normal when you know that things will never be normal. So in that sense, I think that the writing of the piece, the rehearsing was that, uh, that saying, no, no, I, I see you, I see you, I'm not going to avert my gaze. And I know that I cannot be with you a, in the core of the grief, but I can at least I'm I'm seeing you and I am accompanying you. So that's all I can say about it, about that experience. Yeah, well, it's an extremely powerful work, and uh, I, I yeah, yeah it, and it's been my pleasure to, to talk with you a little bit about it. So many questions that you know we yeah. could talk for hours, but <laughs> but uh, thank you so much. Yeah, it is. It it has been. A deep conversation. Thank you so, yes. so much for, for this. Composer Osvaldo Golihoff, who has written Falling Out of Time, it's just been released on the uh, Inner Circle record label. That's the Silk Road Ensemble. We'll link to uh, the Bandcamp page on our website as well. And I really look forward to sharing this music with uh, our listeners. And thank you again uh, for joining thank us. You. Thank You're you. And all, all, the best to you and to your listeners. Thank you.